Let me go ahead and talk to you for a minute about who Matthew is. Uh, I just want to tell you a little bit about Matthew. I love Matthew. Matthew is one of my favorite gospel writers. Actually, if you hear me preach, I'm going to say that about every writer that writes a book of the Bible. I mean, they're one of my favorite authors. But I love, I love Matthew. Matthew was a tax collector before he followed Jesus. And yes, the way they thought of tax collectors like we do today, it's the same way. They're not our friends. They're out to take our money, a little greedy. But for, for Matthew, he was a Jewish tax collector. So that means he was working for the Roman government. So he had a double whammy on him. People really didn't like him. In fact, he would have been one of the last people to ever be chosen to be a disciple of Jesus. And that's what I love about Jesus is because when you go, oh, I don't have room or God will never accept me, you look at the lives of the disciples, especially Matthew, and you'll see that it doesn't matter where you come from or what you've done. Jesus loves you. He came to accept you. He came to reach you. So Matthew is sitting there at his booth doing his job, and Jesus walks by. This is in Matthew chapter 9. And he walks by and he goes, hey, Matthew, you follow me. So Matthew gets up from what he's doing leaves his occupation, leaves his identity, and says, I'm going to follow the Messiah. And so he takes off. Now, the event that happened right after that is really cool, too. And like I said, I really like Matthew, so I'm going to give you a little bit more probably than what I should. But what I really like about the event after is Matthew got all his friends to come over to his house and have dinner. And he invited Jesus, right? And this is that part the Pharisees walk by and they see Jesus with Matthew's friends and they go, what is he doing with those sinners and those tax collectors? Because that's who Matthew's friends were. And Jesus said something so profound. He said, I didn't come to those that are whole. I came to those that are sick and that are in need of a physician. And that is the Jesus I hope that you know. Is a Jesus that doesn't come to those that have it all together. There's a Jesus that doesn't come to those that think that they, that they are the best of the best. He has come to people that are lost and hopeless and feels like they're a reject and they have no place in the church or in religion. Jesus is like, I've come for you. In fact, Jesus and religion clashed so much in the, in the Gospels. And Matthew, as he spent the next three years walking with Jesus and watching him raise the dead and bring uh, and cause the blind to see and he watches him on the cross as he dies and then he beholds his resurrection and his living body and he touches him when he writes his gospel he goes with a flair of to the Jewish perspective or the Jewish mind so if you were Jewish you would you would be more bent to Matthew's gospel because Matthew was trying to and wanted to really really put into words in a picture that Jesus was or is the Messiah that the prophets of old had all talked about. So when you look at Matthew 1, he starts off, and it's really cool, which don't go to Matthew 1. We're going to actually go to Matthew 2. I'm just want to give you some background. But he starts off, says, this is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah. He starts off in, in, with Abraham, and he goes, Abraham is where we're going to start with the genealogy of Jesus because he comes from the seed of Abraham. And if you're a Jew, that was really important. But then he talks 14 generations. Now comes David. And he says, King David, because the promise that God made to David is that you have a son that will sit on your throne forever and ever and ever. And that promise is going to be fulfilled through Jesus. So then he talks about the exile and hits the exile And then he talks about to the time where Jesus, four different time periods, 14 generations, and he gets to Jesus. And he wants the people to know that are reading his gospel, what sets Jesus aside from all, from all the other, all the other in the lineage or genealogy, starting from Abraham, what set him aside? And he goes to the virgin birth. Now, he doesn't take us to Mary's experience Because that's in Luke. Luke writes about that. So he doesn't go to Mary's. He goes to Joseph's experience. Because even Joseph doubted. Joseph was confused whenever Mary said, hey, I'm pregnant and it's God's child. I don't know about you, but I would be confused too. I'd be like, that's, I know, because that's not the way it happens, you know. I, I would be confused, right. And so he was confused and he didn't believe it. And he was trying to figure out how he was going to end this future marriage because they were engaged. And he's like, I'm going to put her away. I'm going to do it privately. You know, we're not going to make a spectacle of this. And then while he's sleeping, an angel shows up and he says, 
This is so cool. He goes, Joseph, this is the act of God. This is the Holy Spirit. It's come upon Mary. You will take that child, and you're going to name, his, you're going to name him Jesus, which Jesus means Jehovah saves. And he goes, because he will save his people from their sins. And then he goes, because it's like it's been recorded in the prophets, it fulfills that Emmanuel has come and he is with us. Emmanuel is God is with us. And Matthew just ties much of his writings back to Old Testament prophets, back to people that had already written hundreds of years before so that we can know who Jesus is and that this Jesus Jesus, born of Mary, not of Joseph, that came through the work of God, a miraculous birth, Jesus of Nazareth is the Messiah. And part of being the Messiah means that you are the anointed king. And so Matthew starts his gospel after this event in chapter 2. And he starts talking about how Jesus and showing that he is the anointed king. And he doesn't just use an event from Jewish people writing something, he goes and finds an event, or not really finds, it's an event that happened. And it's the Magi, and it's the wise men, and it's people from afar, because he wanted to show that this king isn't just king for the Jewish people. This king is king for all people and for all time. So here we are, Matthew chapter 2. It says, and after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi, or if you, depending on what translation you have, it would say wise men, not kings, we'll talk about that in a minute, came from the east to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who was born king of the Jews? And they said, we saw his star when it arose and we've come to worship him. And when King Herod heard, that, heard this, he was disturbed and all of Jerusalem with him. And we had come together, all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law. He asked them where the Messiah was born. Notice, they came looking for a king, but Herod questioned about the Messiah because they're connected. So he says, where's the Messiah born? In verse 5, in Bethlehem, in Judea, without a beat, skipping a beat. For this is what the prophet had written. Remember, Matthew was really big about tying prophecy into Jesus of Nazareth, the Messiah. He says, but in Bethlehem, verse 6, in the land of Judah, are by no means less among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. And then Herod calls the Magi, or wise men secretly, found out from the exact time the star appeared, sent them to Bethlehem, and he said, go, go and search carefully for this child. And as soon as you find him, report him to me so that I may go worship him too. If only that was true. We'll talk about that too. And after they heard the king, they went on their way. And the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming into the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. And they opened their treasures and presented him gifts, this plural, of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. I love, love this story, and I love this event. And hopefully by the end of today, you will love the event, and you will see that Jesus is worthy to worship. We're going to pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. I just pray that today as we open this passage of scripture and we identify some characters, God, I pray that we can put ourselves in place in this moment, in this time, and realize that King Jesus should be my king, and he should be someone I worship and I open myself to, and um, I, I open the treasures of my heart to because he's worthy to be worshiped. And Father, I pray you'll guide me. I pray your words will, will speak through me. Help us to communicate the truths of your word. Help us to leave here changed. And we will give you the honor and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's I talk about some of these characters, all right? So verse 1 says, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea. Now we're going to talk about this with the Magi. When, the, when this event happened, 
Jesus was already out of the stable, all right? But we're going to talk about that with the Magi. I don't want to kill your Christmas or your figurines, but we're, going to, we're just going to destroy them. We're going to get them out of the way, but that's okay. But he says, during the time of Herod. Now, who is King Herod? King Herod uh, was a guy about 34 years before the time of Jesus, was appointed king of Judea. And he would be appointed by the Roman government. Now, here's something interesting. He really had no really power except for it was given to him by the Romans. But he was called King of Judah. He would actually adopt the name King of the Jews. Pretty interesting, right? He would adopt. But they didn't accept him. He was not Jewish to our best knowledge. Now, some people tie him back to Judaism. Uh, but he had such a strong knowledge of the Jewish faith. He understood the Jews and what they believed. He wasn't, he wasn't like an outsider. He was, his father was ingrained into it. So he knew what was going on. In fact, if you go to Acts, you, you have King Agrippa. King Agrippa is a descendant of King Herod. And, and Paul goes, King Agrippa, you know these things to be true. The Herod family understood what was going on. And they were really connected with the Jewish people and they understood, and he wanted to be accepted as their king, and they wouldn't, they wouldn't do it. But the problem with Herod was that Herod really was paranoid, and he thought people was trying to take his throne, and he thought people were, were trying to overthrow him, even so much that his favorite wife, and I, he had several wives, but his favorite wife, and I hate to be his least favorite wife, but his favorite wife, she, she was, he thought she was trying to take the throne or conspired to have him killed, so... He had her killed, just whacked her, like she's dead. Now, that wasn't the worst as well, if that couldn't be bad. He had another wife, and he had three sons, and he had his mother-in-law. Maybe the mother-in-law we understand. No, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. No, it's a joke. No, terrible joke. But he had his mother-in-law. They were all killed because they, he thought, they were going to try to overtake his kingdom and his throne. And we get a picture of how ruthless this man is. When you go home, hopefully you read the rest of chapter 2, you're going to see that he went back to Bethlehem. Well, not really him. He had his people go do it. And they killed all the babies to and under in Bethlehem, the surrounding area, because he was terrified of his throne being taken. He was terrified of losing power and losing position. He was terrified of it that even a toddler threatened him. And he had to have this toddler killed. King Herod was a very smart man. He was able to be very political, but he was ruthless. One of his final acts, when after, shortly after this encounter and him killing these babies, and I believe this is why this happened, he died, a, he got a horrible disease. And um, before he died, he knew people weren't going to mourn. They were going to celebrate. So he took all the important people of Jerusalem, put them in jail, and he says, hey, when I die, execute them. At least they'll be mourning in Jerusalem. Well, they kind of laughed on that. He died. They released him. And Herod goes down in history as the king who sat on a throne in Judea, and he missed the Messiah. Now, it says, so King Herod during this time wasn't a good time, wasn't a great time, a lot of fear, but yet he tried to appease these Jewish people. He, he was also known as, it doesn't matter, but Herod the Great, because he built the temple. He rebuilt the temple. And the temple that Jesus would come to would be the temple that he would build and the temple that was destroyed later on after the time of Christ would be the temple that Herod built. He'd be known as Herod the Great, but it was a time of darkness and cruelty and just a madman sitting on a throne. So after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of Herod, here's the next characters we're going to talk about. The Magi from the east came to Jerusalem. Now, who are these Magi? I kept saying uh, when I read it, are wise men. It depends on what translation you have. Now, no doubt, if you're like me, you have a nativity scene set up in your house, right? Maybe some of you. We have one sitting right back there. And you go back there and you see these three figurines. They look like kings and they have these gifts and they're presenting them to the newborn king. That is all like, that's all make-believe. That didn't happen. All right. So Jesus, the, the, the wise men didn't show up when Jesus was born. That was the shepherds, right? Now that's true. Shepherds, maybe animals, hay. Yeah. 
All that's true. But the Magi, the wise men, they weren't a part of the stable scene at all. So that doesn't mean you go home and you destroy your figurines and go, that's all false or anything. But Jay, if wherever Jay's at, I don't know. But Jay, if you sing that song, We Three Kings of Orient, that's wrong. We all are going to know it's false. All right? That, that's a terrible Christmas. No, I'm just kidding. You can sing it. I don't care. But they weren't Oriental. All right? They weren't Oriental. The gifts they brought, they're probably from Persia or Babylon or, or from, um, from that area over there in that, in, in that part. I should have brought a map so I could show you. But they, they weren't Oriental. Now, they became really famous as after the time of Christ. Second century AD started to make them kings. And that's where we get the three kings from because they made them kings. The reason why we say three is because there was three gifts, right? Chances are there was 12 of them, if not more of them that came, right? So, you know, so it wasn't just three. There, was, there would have been more. And um, what else? How else can I destroy this story? Oh, they, they, um, yeah, they, they, they came up with names in 700 A.D. for them. And, you know, I was in a Christmas play a long time ago, and I played one of these wise men. And, yes, I was a part of the lie and stuff like that. But it was fun. We got to dance and sing and look crazy. So, but, you know, it was Malkiar, I think, was my name. But that all came in 700 A.D. That was all. That didn't happen. And some people think that they represented Noah's sons. And we don't even know if that's true. But what we do know, history tells us simply this, that they were noble men. They were men that were held in high esteem. They were study over the stars. They were philosophers. They could have been priests, right? They're, the name Magi comes from magician, but don't really think magician because that gives a really bad, you know, name to them. Um, they're from Eastern nations. They would go to war and give advice. They were very high esteemed individuals. And when they showed up to Jerusalem, they showed up with a caravan. They didn't show up as three people or five people. They showed up with cooks. They showed up with servants. They showed up with soldiers. So when they came into Jerusalem, it would have been this large group of people. So they couldn't just hide in the night or just slow, like kind of just get in there. Nobody knows. All of Jerusalem was troubled because King Herod was trouble. And notice they got an audience with King Herod. So they had to have some type of clout. They had to be popular and they had to be of, of some type of um, just, just some type of, uh, uh, you know, they like, oh, hey, th these people matter for King Herod to take them in and listen to their audience. So they go in and they meet King Herod and they get audience with King Herod. And this is what they said. In verse 2, where is the one who's been born king of the Jews? We saw his star. Remember, they're studier of the stars. They've been waiting for this. And we have come to worship. Now, the question is, like, one of the questions I had, how in the world would these people have know to be looking for this at this time? Now, if you go back, and I don't want to bore you to death with history stuff, but if you go back, there are historians, Josephus and a couple other, that says that this area, they were expecting a king in Jerusalem to rise to rule the world. There was this expectation, and there was this understanding, like, this is supposed to be happening. Now, for these guys, this is what I believe, for these guys, they were influenced during the exile. You guys remember King Nebuchadnezzar? What did he do? He came into Judah, right? Comes into Judah and he takes the smartest of the youngest, or the maybe like teenagers. And a part of that group was, remember, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? He takes, that's four of the famous ones. There was others that he took, but he takes them captives and brings them back to Babylon. And we realize that, that, uh, that Nebuchadnezzar changed their names, but they, even though their names were changed and the culture was trying to be changed, they still stayed purposed in their heart that they weren't going to defile the Lord. And though you changed their name, their identity and who they were, were going to be people of God, children of God. And they kept that identity. So in chapter 2 of Daniel, you find uh, the king having this dream. All right. So this king had this dream, and he calls together his wise men, his counselors, his advisors, magi. All right. Calls them together and says, hey, I had a dream, and I need you to tell me what this dream means. And they go, oh, okay, well, you tell me the dream, and I'll tell you. And king goes, no, 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 that's not the way it's going to work. You tell me the dream, and then you interpret the dream, and I'll see that you're actually who you are. 
Now, I don't know about you, I would have just died right then because I just would have been like, I don't know where to turn to. And that was what they did. They were like, well, I guess we're dead, right? And so the people came to take Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they're like, we're going we're gonna to come, we're going to take you, and the king's order you to be killed because no one can tell him his dream. And they go, wait, wait, now I'm paraphrasing a little bit. Okay, so they're like, wait, wait, hold up, give us a moment. And so they prayed to God, and they said, hey, king, we know what your dream is. And Daniel goes before the king, and he goes, God has revealed this. So in Daniel chapter 9, I put it on the screen so you can read it. He says, you had a dream of a statue, King Nebuchadnezzar. And the head of that statue was made of fine gold. Some of you are familiar with this story. And its breast and its arms were of silver, its belly and its thighs of bronze, its legs of iron. Huge statue, right? Huge statue. Its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. And then he says, this is so important, you continued looking into a stone. It was cut out with, or it was cut without hands. So it just appeared, right? And it struck this statue on its feet of iron and clay, and it crushed them. And then he goes on to explain, King Nebuchadnezzar, you are that fine gold. You are that head. Hey, go back to that last slide, because I want to I want to just, as I talk through it. So, and I told her to change it in my notes, so that was my fault. So, but he's a, you are that head of statue that was a fine gold. That's what you are. That's the Babylonian empire, but there's going to come another empire that's going to come and overtake you, and that's the silver. And then for them, there's going to be another empire that comes and is going to overtake them, and that's the bronze. And then finally, there's going to be another kingdom it's going to overtake them. It's going to be the iron. If you know anything about history, Nebuchadnezzar, Babylon, was the, was the empire. During his, uh, during his son's time, the Medes and Persians came in, and they overthrew the kingdom of Babylon. They would be the silver. And then this guy named Alexander the Great shows up, Greece and Greeks and stuff, and they overthrow the Medes and the Persians. They would be the bronze. And eventually, during the time of Jesus, the Roman Empire would become the empire and they'd be identified as the iron. We're still, in a way, waiting for the rest of it to happen. But the promise is that there will come a day, a rock, a stone not made with human hands that is going to come and destroy this statue. This statue that represents all the kingdoms of man. See, before Nebuchadnezzar, before that, the last Jewish king to sit on the throne of Judea fell into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar. There has not been another king that has sat on the throne that has been called king of the Jews. The next one, we believe, is going to be Jesus Christ. In fact, I believe his kingdom is already, well, I don't believe the Bible teaches, his kingdom has already started. It's just not of this world, but one day it will be of this world. But the stone that is promised is that of Jesus to come and destroy all the kingdoms of the world. And Daniel would have taught that because after that, Nebuchadnezzar goes, oh, that's what I had. You're correct. Your God is great. No God likes you. And he goes, you will be protector of the Magi. And now Daniel is influencing these Babylonians, these Magi, these wise men, these counselors. And of course, he is... He is making sure that they know, that they know that eventually, one day, there's going to come a king, and a king's going to come from Jerusalem, and it's going to be God's king, and he's going to establish his rule, he's going to establish his reign, he's going to establish his kingdom. And so these magi, in my opinion, were looking and waiting for that prophecy, and they are waiting for a sign. And if we go through, I think it's numbers that talks about a star, and it's really cool once you start diving into it. But they knew, because they were waiting, because the influence of Daniel, that one day there was going to come a king, and they were anticipating it, and they were wanting to see it happen, and it shows up. So they came to worship this king, and what's significant is that for this magi is that the birth of this king was not only for the Jewish people, It'd be a king for the entire world. So verse 3 says, When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, which we've already talked about why he would be disturbed, and all of Jerusalem with him. And when he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. Now he knew it was the Messiah, 
I mean, he knew the understanding of the Messiah. They came looking for a king, but he pointed back to the Messiah. He understood what it meant and what it was. And so they, without skipping a beat, they said, I was in Bethlehem in Judea, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler and will be shepherd of my people. You know, I don't want to spend much time on this, but the scribes, the chief's priests, the teachers of the law, of all the people in this story, of all the people they should have known and been anticipating and been waiting for this king to arrive, they knew what the Bible said, or the prophets said, the Torah said, the Old Testament said. They knew what Isaiah and Michael had written. They should have been the ones on the edge of their seat. Now, maybe it was fear that kept them. Maybe they're too terrified of what Herod would do. And that's a reasonable explanation of that. Maybe they were comfortable with where they were at. We know that in the lifetime of Jesus, when he was here for those three, three and a half years, he had a lot of conflict with those people, the religious people of the day. Do you know this? This is free. This has nothing to do with the message. Jesus and religion, they, cra- they, they clash. They don't mix. Jesus came and religion said, no, we don't want you here. And Jesus goes, oh no, you've got it all wrong. Because religion's man-made. Religion is about me as a man and me creating God to be something. And God goes, no, 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 I'm going to bring Jesus and flesh, God and flesh, and I am God. I am not religion. So if you have a problem with religion, you and Jesus, good company. You guys know, good company right there. But these people should have known. These people should have been anticipating You know what, Christians today, we know God's word, we know what it says, but sometimes we fail to act on it, right? Sometimes we fail to live it out in our lives. Sometimes we we will, maybe it's fear, maybe we're uncomfortable, maybe we don't know what we're going to lose, but we, of all people, know his word, and we should act on it before others. And it says, Herod, in verse 7, called the Magi secretly and found out from the exact time the star appeared, And he sent them to Bethlehem, and he says, go and search carefully for the child, because he wanted to go worship him. Now, we all know that that was a lie, that was all a deceit, right? His words said one thing, but his actions said another, right? I think we can all probably connect with that a little bit. But for me, King Herod, he's the king of Judah at that time, right? He's overgiven this power, He had an awesome opportunity to point people to the Messiah, and he missed them. He missed them because his power and his position were going to be overtaken. Because see, listen, when Jesus comes into your life, Jesus steps into your life, and there's only one place for him to be. That's for him to be Lord and to be King. The governments of the world struggle with Jesus because Jesus is king. He is governor. He's to rule over your life. So it's no surprise to me that the government of the land did not want this Jesus, did not want my Jesus. And maybe sometimes, if we're honest, the reason why Jesus isn't king in our life is because we don't want him to take that rightful position. And God's not going to come a-begging. God's not going to come a pleading. He is king, and he's worthy to be worshipped, and he should be king of your life. But Herod missed it. Verse 9, And after they heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen, when it rose, went ahead of them, until it stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. What a great attitude to have when you come before the king, right? And then coming in the house... They saw the child with his mother married, and they bowed down and worshipped him. And they opened their treasures their, their, and presented gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Listen, when they came, this is the proper way to worship the king. They showed up, and they bowed down before the child. Not Mary, the child. And Matthew's careful to put that in there because in the God's word, the only ones, if you will, if I can use that word, ones, that are ascribed to worship is God Almighty. 
Right? We've seen, there's a time in Revelations where John had an angel, and he falls down, and the angel goes, what are you doing? Get up. You don't worship me. In God's word, if you're not worshiping God, you're in disobedience. The only ones that should have worship and that the Bible ascribes to worship is that of God himself. So when they were worshiping Jesus, it was a, it was a sign of that he is deity. He is God with us. He is God, and they come before him and notice their posture. They fall to the ground, but then they open up their treasures. That is the proper way to worship King Jesus, is for us to come before him. In the Bible, Jesus says, the treasures of your heart, right? That's where, that's where your treasures are, is in your heart. You're to open your heart. When we come in here and we sing and we do it, and we did a phenomenal job at it today, we are to open ourselves up and say, Jesus, you are are worthy of praise. You are worthy of honor. That is how we are to come before the King of Jesus. Now, these gifts that were brought, I, I've heard many good preachers preach the significance of these gifts. And there's some commentaries, great information. I don't know, and I'm not going to stand up here to pretend to know, that these gifts represented anything about the life of Jesus because what I know is that Mary and Joseph had a poor man's sacrifice when they came to present Jesus. And I know that after this event, they went to Egypt, and then they went to Nazareth, and they needed money because they didn't have any money. And I think these gifts kind of helped finance God taking them through. But these gifts are significant. There's some type of meaning, like gold. Gold is a gift that's only, that should only be given to a king, and it just shows royalty. Frankincense is like an incense that you burn. Some of you ladies know that. You burn those incense. It's like the sweet smelling, you know, stuff. You know, you guys got that, right? So the frankincense, that's what it is. It was used for sacrifice. For the Jewish person, they would use it for sacrifice and be like a sweet aroma to God. And myrrh, during the time of Jesus, myrrh was used to cover the dead bodies because they would decompose and the stench would be bad, so they would pack them down with myrrh. In fact, when Jesus died, they put hundreds or a hundred pounds, at least of myrrh and ointments on his body to hide what would eventually could be the stench. Do they represent Jesus? I don't know, but this is what I know. is my king. My king went to the, he came to this earth and he died and he, well, he was a sacrifice and he, and he died on a cross. Now, before he died on that cross, the Roman soldiers whipped his back with this thing called a cat of nine tails. Think of a leather belt with glass and rock and bone, and it would grab the back and it would pull him off, and it would pull off the skin and the flesh and it would open him up. And before that, they put this crown on his head and they beat it into a skull and they put a robe on him and they held him as king of the Jews. Complete mockery. And then he goes and he's led to a cross where he stretches his arms out and his, his hands are pierced and his feet are pierced and he bleeds and he's gasping for breath. And, he, and then when it was all complete, Jesus looks up and says, it is finished and he breathes his last breath. It wasn't the Roman guards who killed Jesus. It wasn't even these scribes and these priests that's not why Jesus was on the cross. Jesus came to be a sacrifice for you. And Jesus showed it in his last moments of, of his life, if you will, that when he was ready and the sacrifice was complete, he determined that it was all said and done. Because the sacrifice of Jesus was enough to cover your sins and to cover my sins. If you don't know Jesus, you know this. Today you have you have a payment that you owe, and that payment is called sin. And the payment requires death. And Jesus came. And Jesus came to die and offer that sacrifice and die in your place. Three days later, he rose again. And he stepped out of that grave, and God said, I'm satisfied with his sacrifice. Isn't Jesus worthy to be praised? Isn't he worthy to be worshipped? Right? Isn't the proper response for you and I to this king, not the king for the Jewish people, but the king for all time, isn't it the proper response for us to come before him and to open the treasures of our hearts and say, God, it is all yours. 
Here I am, laying my life down for you. Verse 12 says this, And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Listen, when you encounter Jesus, you leave change. When you encounter Jesus, you leave change. My desire for you today is if you don't know Jesus, encounter him this morning. Come to know my Jesus. Religion's not the answer. Jesus would tell you that. He didn't like religion. Jesus is the answer. Matthew records in chapter 1, you will call his name Jesus because he will save you from his people, from their sins. And his name is called Emmanuel. See, God with us. Jesus comes in as a baby, takes on flesh, never to be different. Never to be different. He will always be God manifested in the flesh and his purpose is to do life with you, to have a relationship with you. If you've encountered Jesus, you got to change. And that's the only way is when you encounter him, you leave differently. Have you encountered Jesus? Is he worthy to be worshipped to you? I hope this season you ask that question as you look at the tree and you look at your figurines and see that they're false and they're fake. But we know that that baby is real. And that baby came, and that was God saying, I love you. I hope you know Jesus. Let's bow our heads. Let's close our eyes. Father, we just want to thank you so much for what your word is. God, what a cool story to come. And the people from afar off came to worship you and say that you are the king. God, today your kingdom has been established. It's been set up. Paul tells us that we, before Christ, we are in the kingdom of darkness, but when we come to Christ, we are transferred to the kingdom of his dear son. Lord, I thank you so much for that kingdom. I thank you for the people in here that are part of that kingdom. But God, there are some that don't know you, and they're not a part of the kingdom. God, if that is them, I pray today that they will recognize that their sin is what's causing them to stay out. And I pray they'll realize that Jesus died on a cross. And Jesus paid for their sin. In fact, Lord, if they're sitting in this audience and you're one of those that you know that Jesus paid for your sins and he died for you, but yet you haven't yet made that moment to say, Jesus, I believe, then I want to invite you right now to end the quietness of your heart to say, God, I believe in you. God, I know Jesus died for me and I accept you into my life. If you did that, I, I would love to talk to you and have a conversation with you. Now, for the rest of us, we're in the kingdom. How's your worship been? Lord, I pray that you'll work in our heart. I pray that you will speak to our heart and we'll come to you and we'll come and open up all that we have. I pray that we'll come and worship you and we'll show, we'll demonstrate it through our actions, how we treat one another, but really how we serve and honor you. God, thank you for your son. Thank you so much for the cross. And we ask this in your name. Amen. Amen.